Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Movies and Tea. I'm your host as always, Edward Jones, and joining me of course is my co-host Miss Kim Lowe. Hello. Uh, tonight we are talking about Edges 17 um, as we continue our look of female directors of note. Uh, tonight we will move on to Kelly Fremont Craig, a screenwriter turned director. This uh, film being her directorial debut in 2016. A coming of age story starring Haley Steinfeld who here plays Nadine, a 17 year old high school junior who lives in the suburbs of Portland and after suffering a temptuous uh, friendship with her with her best friend who has decided to go off with her overachieving older brother uh, she finds her whole life thrown into an absolute tailspin as she attempts to find meaning and purpose in her life once again um, certainly this film joined a wave of exciting new coming of age films including the likes of Booksmart and reminding us there was still life in the genre after the early 2000s had seen a real sort of decline and really sort of seen the subgenre really sort of fall into sort of a quagmire of mediocrity. So it was this film really sort of came out of nowhere and just sparked a lot of excitement for everyone who's seen it as Greg announced herself really as this exciting new voice who'd kind of always been there, but this finally gave her the breakout that she much deserved. But uh, Kim, I know you're a big fan of this film, so let's uh, go to you for your opening thoughts first. <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to start with you, and I've heard you already set it up that I'm a big fan. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I'm a big fan of the genre in general, of just, you know, coming-of-age teen movies. And yeah, I don't know, it... It's what it's somewhere that you know. I like watching TV series of it. I like watching movies of it. I like watching Chinese dramas of it. It's kind of my thing. And no matter like, now I it's like kind of weird that at my like at the you know I'm I'm approaching mid thirties now, and I still really really love this genre a lot, even though my generation gap with it is growing and growing. <laughs> And I tend to sometimes mock a bit of, like, the lingo and that sort of thing that happens in it. But, I mean, it's great to watch how the genre has kind of changed over the years. Obviously, I mean, as I was watching this this time and preparing for, obviously, this talk, my thoughts were actually more along the lines of how we started this season with Clueless which is a 90s look at kind of the, you know, the rich girl and her coming of age story. Yeah. Whereas when we hit Edge of 17, it's a completely different story because now we're having this character Nadine which um has obviously some self-esteem issues. Uh, I, and she lives in this world where we finally understand at the end where she kind of thrives kind of in this she needs to she seems to always live in this world where she thinks she feels like it's never gonna get better kind of thing it's never gonna it's just it's just she's kind of in this world where she thinks she's not good enough and nothing's ever gonna be better and she always needs to feel bad for herself that everybody get has it better than herself to make herself i don't know just I don't know, feel like, feel a little better. I don't know <laughs> what it is that she, it's very, I don't know. It's a very complicated thing that she goes through. Um, and I think that's what makes this whole journey of the few days, pretty much, of how this story goes by that, I don't know, maybe it goes through maybe a series of a week or whatever, that we see her go through these different moments in life that changes her uh, as she kind of faces these things where in her mind that she thinks is so good but you know doesn't it's kind of like a whole world of what you expect and what is reality type of thing yeah definitely so i mean obviously the character in the dean she's right from the start I and mean, even from her early years she's seen as this sort of like wandering spirit who struggles to find 
people to sort of anchor herself to and initially the people who sort of give her that sort of grounding to stop her feeling so lost is her father Tom who unfortunately dies of a heart attack when she's 13 leaving her best friend Krista as the sort of sole sort of support that she has in her life and we see them they have this adorable friendship as they grow up and it's almost like we see with uh, the characters in Ghost World of Enid and Rebecca, they've got this almost like sister-like friendship between them. But like those characters that unfortunately life causes them to drift apart, or in this case a arguably ill-advised handjob that uh, Krista decides to give to Nadine's older brother. Um, which spark leads to her being involved in a relationship with him. And Nadine's brother is kind of uh you know one of these people that everything goes his way he's as she describes him he's just like a born winner and the fact that he now in her eyes at least is seen as stealing her best friend leaving her with nothing once again and it's throws her into this sort of tailspin of like well what do i have now it's sort of like what defines me as a person now that i've lost my best friend i've got essentially nothing and i'm now having to like guide my way through like the sort of perils of high school so to speak yeah and and you know but i i really like movies like this because it kind of what the situation she gets when she loses this person that she clings on to who pretty much is her comfort zone she breaks out of this comfort zone where she starts realize, you know, she starts obviously being approached by other people now that she's not in her own zone. So the first person that approaches her is this, this Asian guy, Erwin, who is awkward as heck whenever <laughs> he talks to her. And, but somehow those are my favorite, favorite parts of the movie because they, it, it, it really, you really see her open up from the beginning character of herself being in her world and and then as she starts realizing Erwin's not scared of kind of pointing out in in his own way like what her problem is that she doesn't listen to other people she's kind of in her own world she kind of thinks everything she she's in many ways she doesn't realize that she's very self-centered and many things she kind of goes into very extreme type of thought process. Just like how she reacts to Krista being, you know, choosing to be with her brother. And and when she refuses, like when she decides to go in a relationship with him and and she she goes to setting an ultimatum for her and and that sort of thing. And it really defines that character of where she starts off that She's in this, I guess she's even a bit possessive. She's a bit self-centered. She's a bit possessive. She really just wants to hold on to the things that that she believes is going on, that's going well for her. But then, you know, obviously, obviously, like we said, she, you know, Krista doesn't choose, but she pretty much chooses for her and she decides to end this friendship. Yeah, it's, and... I think in many ways it's not just the fact that Krista's decided to go off with uh, Nadine's brother, uh, but I think also uh, the fact that she's also using this relationship to expand her social circle beyond yeah. this little like one friend. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in many ways it's it hurts Nadine the fact how easily her friend is able to adapt to new certain like meeting new people and expanding their social circle and she's always seen them themselves as like you know these kindred spirits that they don't really need anyone else and she sort of struggles at the same party to form those same connections with um with anyone and even like the one person she seems to be forming a connection with ultimately just turns out to want to draw comparisons uh between her and her brother being like Dan DeVito and on Schwarzenegger and twins uh, like <laughs> how these two people how these two people can be related to each other when they're such complete polar opposites to each other and it's um I think it's when she obviously uh meets meets Erwin um and and goes to that point and decides to go and hang out with Erwin and that she finds this uh person that she has a connection with but at the same time he's in a completely different place to how he sees the the relationship he thinks it's like um 
it's, it's sort of like a romantic interest and she's not sure exactly what it is that she wants from him she just knows there's some sort of a connection there and I think it really what really there's a really mo great moment that highlights it so subtly in the fact that she's at home and she's listening to Amy Mann's uh, Save Me which is on the uh, Magnolia soundtrack and we flip to him and uh, he's listening to uh, Genghis Khan and it's like the two pieces of music really sort of match the mood to these characters. He's like, you know, he's just having his every Saturday night. He's just hanging at home and she's got this feeling of being like lost and hurt and betrayed. And she's looking for someone to to latch on to. Um, and I think it's just so sort of portrayed just how sort of polar opposites that these, these, these two characters are yet when they're brought together on the sort of first wheel they find this uh that they have this connection they can share awkward humor between each other they can make fun of each other and it's all okay and you see the beginning of this 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 friendship blossoming between them even though she's not exactly sure what it is that um that she sees in him but she just seems to enjoy being around him yeah I mean, Erin is, is, you know, right away at the beginning, her way of describing him is kind of like, like, pretty much a person that she just considers as a nice guy. You know, he's yes. a nice guy. He's a nice friend. And kind of the label that probably a lot of, I, I guess a lot of guys don't like, especially when we think about movies, because you get, you get, you know, <laughs> pretty much your friend zone right away. But... We all been there. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I feel you, buddy. It's so like, yeah, and it's sort of like, oh, you're just such a, you're, you're like the the nice guy, and it's so sort of like, I was so glad that Jingo, like, you know, you're gonna find someone, and they're gonna be so lucky, and I was sort of like, yeah, we didn't. I'm so glad you didn't go down that route. <laughs> Otherwise, this movie would have gone real south for me. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's really great because we we have this this whole conversation about how he how she sees him as this this you know this wise old man. Yes. And, and he and she's like this is a compliment and he just doesn't understand why it is, but sure, you know, if you think it's a compliment type of thing. Yeah, and it's it's kind of fun the fact that how the their relationship grows really because it's not just like for this moment on the now just like hanging out all the time and they're forming this like new yeah. exciting like friendship she like has this one outing with him and then you know a few days go past and then she decides to call him up and and hang out again and they go she goes to hang out in his pool and of course this being the movie world he's 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 the nerdy guy but he's also completely ripped it's so like no nerdy guy looks like that <laughs> he's just like he's just absolutely like he's uh he's absolutely cut so it's okay for him her to be involved with uh him because he's got the uh he's got the body as well to go with the awkwardness so <laughs> it's like none of my nerdy friends looked anything like that it's all just pasty and <laughs> and uh built for comfort <laughs> But well, yes. I, would, I wouldn't say that, but I mean, like, it's just really, you know, for, for Erwin, I think it's a little bit different, too, because he, I like the fact that she calls him this wise old man, and then we refer right away to, to her, it's a compliment, and we realize that in a conversation, also some of the really greatest parts, is when he has, a, she has this conversation of, with the, with her teacher, I think it's an English teacher or something, or history teacher or something. And yeah, it's a history teacher. Yeah, so it's uh, Mr. Bruner, played by Woody Harrelson. And it's the most hilarious thing, because you would never expect, I think I've ever only had one teacher who was like this teacher kind of thing okay. like he had kind of a little bit of an attitude but it was a younger guy which turned up to have some pretty uh which i've heard has uh, had some pretty um disgusting news of him from, <laughs> of his career after i left school so <laughs> i'm sorry this is this is a whole other story we need to be looking at when yeah, so, was so, he was he involved with students are you yeah saying, pretty or? much that's what i heard so yeah 
So See? either way, <laughs> no reflection of this character, but um, it was kind who, of like who I've were never these had students, a... Kim? What? Who were these students, Kim? Do we know them? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> okay, I don't know. I, I, I don't even remember who they were, but I don't, I don't know if they were in my grade or not. Even I don't I don't know, but I heard about it after I left after right, I graduated okay. high school. But anyways, back to this. So what yes. I really liked was she was talking to him during this this lunchtime where, you know, obviously it's her first time and um, she goes look for Erwin. Erwin's not Erwin's busy with his uh, film 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 festival mo- uh, project type of thing. Yeah. And then and then she goes into this empty cafeteria and how, you know, the the shot is seen is she's kind of like this one person in this kind of. Uh, just the cafeteria. I wouldn't call it big because I was in a pretty big school and I can't say it's big. But um, but yeah, and then she just you just see her in this lonely sea of students and then she ends up going to pretending that she has a question to ask and she goes sits down with this this teacher and sits down and has lunch with him. <laughs> Which is very, very awkward. And then she talks about she complains about her generation and the obsession with the phones and emojis and all that sort of stuff and calls herself an old soul. And then you realize from that point that what she says to Erwin is actually what she says to what he says to Erwin makes sense where it is a compliment that she calls him an old man <laughs> <laughs> because it kind of sets him apart from the people that she the, the reason why she's not socializing with other people as well. Um, kind of this, I guess this subjectiveness uh, thing that she has a, against other people that she can't seem to fit in. Yeah, and I think this the film really sort of captures the awkwardness of the of, of this particular age. is sort of like entering into your sort of wilderness years. And you don't know what to to do with yourself. And I think, obviously, when it comes to Mr. Bruner, who's, as I said, he's this teacher who's basically knows that most of these students are just fly, uh, sort of like sailing by his class, but he sort of like knows which ones are are actually taking on board what he's teaching. And obviously, in the case of the, of um, Nadine, he's. As I said, he cites as one being one of his favorite students because she actually takes the time to point out mistakes that he's made um, in his in his uh, class, and they have like these these uh, sort of like lunchtime meetings. But at the same time, he's incredibly open because he knows that's the best way to communicate with her. So it's just like the opening uh, segment where it's sort of like she like comes in, and it's like I'm going to kill myself, and he's like, "Oh, funny, I was just thinking the same thing." Here, let me <laughs> read this to you. <laughs> and it basically like decides the fact that she keeps interrupting his lunch break every day with her problems. Um, but I think Woody Harrelson's character is just really sort of great. He plays this wonderful sort of mentor yeah. character to her uh, because I think it's important when you have this sort of conversation that you have like the adult mentor sort of character there to get you back on track. Because to have children, kids figure out what they want, and I think this is what was kind of missing in Clueless in the fact that. Share somehow comes to this miraculous idea of what she's supposed to do without really um, having the adult mentor thing. It was just sort of like more, it more she came to what the idea of path she was supposed to be on, and then it was sort of like having the adult say, "Yes, you are doing a good thing." Whereas <laughs> um, when it comes to Mister Bruna, he's just sort of there to be the sort of sounding board and to basically nudge her back onto the right path and ultimately pick her up when she falls on her face yeah i mean mr bruner's character is something of a reality check right he's not scared to tell things as as harsh as they may be you know like he straight up he straight out says you know maybe nobody likes you you know or or pretty much you know like things aren't as bad as you see them type of thing and then at the same time he kind of offers him uh, offers nadine kind of a helping hand when she needs it and you know he seems like a really kind of <laughs> the way he talks sometimes feels like a very rude teacher but at the same time Nadine kind of needs this because she's growing up in this environment where her brothers 
in this world where she dislikes him, so she's not going to ask him for help. And her mother, after the father's death for the few years, is struggling. She's trying to find her own way as well. She She's kind of lost her own support system. And with that, she doesn't bond with Nadine, and she's not much of a mother to her in that sense, where... She, you know, in a conversation that they have when, you know, she picks her up from the party that she leaves, there's this whole thing where she's not comforting. Nadine is obviously having issues, but she starts talking about her issues and then Nadine needs to comfort her mom (laughs) instead. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, her mother's really sort of struggling deal with the passing of her, her husband who is, is safe to say was pretty much the rock of this family unit yeah. in many ways i mean obviously while when he was alive like the like her mum was able to just devote um all her attention on to her brother and obviously since losing this uh this, this her rock she sort of struggled to deal with the fact that she's now like the so one so responsible for handling all these sort of issues so she's constantly ended up f- falling back on her son to sort of step up and and fill that sort of role and to help her with with Nadine even as a stranger situation as that that is and it's really by the end that he sort of like stands up and like points out the fact that she just constantly relies on him yeah and that the problems isn't just on Nadine, as yeah. uh, she likes to want, want to obviously say, because her and Nadine have this very conflicting relationship. They're very alike in mind, so neither the yeah. side is wanting to back down. And while it creates these wonderful moments of uh, conflict between them, um, such as she she's forced to like continue drop Nadine off at school because she doesn't want to see Krista and uh, she arrives at school one day and like Krista's there and she's like no mom I want to drive around the block again it's not going to be soon and she's like no I, you're going to work and you're going to explain to my boss and they have this like conflict in her office where she's just like oh but I can write down exactly what you're thinking and it's just this <laughs> wonderful back and forth but about at the same time going into like that super witty child uh, territory that you yeah. had expected to the 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 dialogue always feels very sort of realistic for this this character she is constantly like confused as what she wants she never seems to know what she needs but at the same time she's she's uh, saki but she's never like uh sort of wise beyond her years she's not like the juno of this uh film at all mm-hmm. yeah but you know what it is is i you start seeing is that mom and nadine are actually very similar in character in the sense that not only is it that they don't back down but their personalities are actually the same like ma they're going through the same thing just at a different age where both of them at this point has lost their rock both of them has has these very dramatic type of personality um they both seem to wallow in some kind of low self-esteem, some type of self-pity. And when you see this parallel of just how her mom is telling her about her coping mechanism, about how she wants her, you know, when you think things are bad, you just think that everybody in the world is as miserable as I am, and they're just better at pretending. And in reality, I feel that Nadine kind of thinks the same way, especially in the end when you we have that very, you know, this very touching conversation that she opens up to her brother Darian about this. And they, you know, she tells her him about pretty much just how she thinks that, you know, she how she really believes that um, she you know, she she needs to can't find that where's the stupid notes that i made (laughs) okay yeah so she's talking to her brother and she's making it where you know there's this deranged part where she believes that only her has problems and that makes her special and in the same way that's kind of very similar to how her mother is and i think it's mostly because of that where when two people are too similar in personality they end up having a harder time kind of getting through to each other obviously they're both I, breaking out of their own ways and 
and Darian has to pick up the mess of these two people. Uh, who, you know, obviously Nadine doesn't see until, until the end when, you know, Darian not only tells off mom about about how, you know, if you're an adult, then why do you keep calling me? But at the same time, telling Nadine off about, yes, my life is so great, and then tells, off, tells her about the things that he's had to sacrifice for this family, that it's not really as great as you keep thinking it is. Everybody's suffering through this in this in their own ways yeah definitely so um and i mean how did you find heli uh steinfeld as in as a lead actress here because i i really like her work i mean she's one of those actors that i never sort of think of like all the time, but I'm always sort of excited when she does turn up in things, and I think since she really sort of launched herself on the screen with, like, True Grit, and since then she sort of, like, appeared in things like, you know, the Pitch Perfect movie, she was in the voice mm-hmm. of Gwen Stacy in uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and she obviously headed up Bumblebee, which is probably one of the best Transformers movies in years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, she constantly, like, um, keeps, like, exploding in and out of my movie-going life. <laughs> and um I as I said I I know I think the the kids that like um, follow her music more cuz I mean she's obviously a singer as well so Yeah. Uh but no it's I, I like her when she when she turns up in things but she's not sort of actress I sort of seek out but hey, here I thought she was really fantastic in the sort of lead role here as Nadine I think she really sort of captured what this character was about this sort of person trying to find themselves and everything's so sort of awkward and it's uh she said like trying to she thinks that if she can just like complete different sort of goals in her life that everything's going to fall into place like she wants to sleep with the uh the hot guy who works at the fish place and she thinks that this is what she wants and these these like little battles that she faces throughout the films and i think she just portrays it all with such a a feeling of generosity it feels very genuine what i was watching here it didn't feel like i was watching like something that's been like scripted by an adult to make this child seem like super smart and worldly and witty and all the rest of these sort of pitfalls that we find with uh these sorts of movies really but i think that that's that like i agree and and that's what makes this i think in reality like the script really stands out here and it really shows that um that you know obviously uh uh kelly Fremont uh craig her writing is really on point here and that really powers nadine's character because these are all things i guess obviously this is all in a very short period of time and kind of like a nutshell quick version of of everything happening at the same time um maybe in real life these things are gonna take a little bit longer to go through all the events that she goes through um but what do I know, right? Everyone's different. Uh, but, I mean, the things that she goes through are, are things that are very relatable. And it's not just... It might be a little bit the generation that she's trying to highlight. Like, our current, you know, the generation of the 2010s in high school and their, you know, their struggles. And they have their own, you know, mentality that they need to go through. But... In reality, every single, you know, I'm sure a lot of people in our age group went through it just with less technology and less, you know, Facebook where you can, like, you know, worry about friend requests and stuff. Um, But obviously, you know, Nadine goes through a lot of things where a lot of people have gone through and and just, you know, a teenage girl, it's easy to go through where you, you have a crush on this bad boy character or whatever in school that you think is so dreamy or whatever he is and then and then it's just kind of like a crush that you have through school and most people don't act on it and in this case she acts on it and then she realizes that he's not really as dreamy as she sees him as you know obviously she's not she knows what he wants what will get his attention but at the same time she's hoping that after getting this attention it's going to be something that's you know changed the way that's more of a deeper connection than just kind of like the physical connection but obviously this guy is not like that where you know it kind of hits her that 
maybe this isn't what she wants. And obviously the next day she, she, she goes back to, you know, what's important to her. And yeah. yeah. So. Okay. I mean, were you disappointed that we didn't have the ultimate sort of like connection between Nadine and Irwin? No, I think the ending did really well because the ending kind of sets up their, their relationship mm. uh, where she goes to meet him. And, and there's this parallel of what happens in the beginning when she kind of, um, you know, when she was with, when she goes to the party at the beginning with uh, Krista and Darian, she tries to get into conversations, but no one really gets her involved. And Krista leaves her, you know, it's not, you know, obviously it's not a bad thing, but like, for her, it's just Krista leaves her to meet these new people. Whereas when you compare it back to Erwin, Erwin's position is different. Erwin is kind of taking on that part where he's encouraged, she, he's encouraging her to be in his group of friends. When she tries to back away, he pushes her back into the group, kind of, he pulls her back into the group. And it's someone who notices her. And I think that just by that little gesture, you know that, you know, this is kind of a start of, you know, whether you can interpret this that they're together now, obviously, they've start. This is kind of like their way of dating because she understands, you know, what he's trying to portray with the little film that he does, which I think is so cute. And and at the same time, you have this kind of reverse and roles at the last scene of their friendship and changing kind of changing their friendship to something more of a, you know, a, 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 a boyfriend, girlfriend type of situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I, it's just, I just, it's, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, the subtle things are good. Um, yeah. Because you don't really need to be all, you know, kissing first time type of thing. You don't need to go through all those things in order to show a connection between two people. Yeah. It was just, um, as it, I think it's just something about this, <laughs> about her brother going off with her best friend that just really irks me. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it just goes against some sort of code somewhere, but, um, yeah, there's just something that that always sort of like, I think I think it sort of ruins the brother character like forevermore. The fact he goes and steals away the best friend is sort of like, it's sort of like you could have anyone you wanted, and you decide to go and do hand jobs with her best friend. But at the same That's... time, I mean, if you think about it, if this didn't happen, then Nadine would always be with that one person, and then they wouldn't know how to break out of this comfort zone and i think I that know. everybody has that changing point where you need to be able to have that change in order to see the things around you it's 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 very much like you know um the like it, it's kind of a blessing in disguise and, or you know the the whole thing about you know when someone closes a door or a window opens or something you know so, i think it's because I enjoyed their relationship so much. The the on screen chemistry between Haley Stanfield and Haley Lou Richardson, who plays uh, Krista, it's just so good during those open moments. And I think it's because we don't get enough of it. It's just we're just getting into the groove with these these two girls and the friendship that they have, and it's just snatched away from us. And we feel as hurt as Nadine does about it. And at least for myself, at least I was just I was just like uh, from that moment on, it was just like you know. Fuck you, Darian. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have that same thing. And in reality, oh, okay. I think that it's it's Haley Steinfeld's character. You know, like Nadine's character is really, really hard to back sometimes at the beginning because a lot of things she does makes her feel like she's a brat. You know, like a lot. Sure, she's had a bad life, but you know, she's wallowing in this this low self esteem, this self pity, and she she does a lot of things that I don't like, like, you know, setting ultimatums and kind of trapping herself in a corner. And it's I guess it's just, you know, things I've dealt with before with other people and other friends that are like that, that kind of bring up this kind of like sour taste in my mouth when I'm dealing with this character. But when but it's because the character starts off like that that you really feel her redeeming herself when the movie goes along and we start seeing her change and kind of accepting things and 
you know, seeing kind of what's wrong with her a little. Uh, about, you know, like, just kind of being in her little world. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I don't have that big of a problem with it. I... I understand, but, you know, a lot of movies nowadays, especially coming-of-age movies and little movies like that, are always like that. I mean, if they didn't have that plot, the kissing booth would never happen, you know? And not that I'm saying that's a good movie. I'm not behind those movies <laughs> at all. Uh, but, um, you know, feel free to argue with me. I have very strong feelings about that movie. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean... A lot of movies base it on that and it's not it's not so weird you know when you have this person who's with you all the time it's not weird when you have this person who's just in your life and then your brother is suddenly comes in or reverse whatever if it's you know what whatever role it's someone that you see all the time and sure it's a little bit weird because Krista lives in this world where she mocks Darian with Nadine but at the same time, when, you know, it, it goes to the point where does it really matter whether you're mocking him? I guess during that night when Nadine was shit-faced in the bathroom, they had a really good chat. And then they kind of, you know, got to know each other better, which is something that doesn't happen because Nadine is always talking bad about Darian in front of her. Um, yeah, I don't, anything else that you want to talk about this one? Because I think I've... I think we're done. I think we're done. Um, for viewing then, if you do want to see more movies like Edge of Seventeen, I don't think it's even a question of if you like Edge of Seventeen, Edge of Seventeen's an awesome movie. I think it's really fantastic. And it held, I was surprised how well it held up to a repeat viewing. Um... Because I, 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 <laughs> I repeat viewing of it like every year. When it I know you Netflix repeat though. viewing of it. As I said, sometimes you watch a movie and, and you're in that like perfect time and place for a film and it just like captures you and then you go back to it and you think, oh, this is going to be really great. And it's like, oh, this, this wasn't as good as I thought it was. So it was kind of nice and uh, it was surprising that it just hit all the same chords again for myself. So. But uh, I don't know. Maybe you like him and just like watch it all the time, and don't need me to tell you how good it is. But <laughs> that was my cat. Then <laughs> okay. So she's just started snoring because she's decided to be a fat lump in front of me on the washing. So <laughs> okay. Can you bloody snore somewhere else? You I'm trying to record here and be professional. <coughs> Right, uh, for viewing though, um, what would you like to pair with this, Kim? Uh, I mean, there's an array of movies. I mean, we refer to Clueless, obviously. Um, mm. And um, obviously there's movies like Lady Bird, which is also a very um, kind of a singular kind of experience of someone just coming coming of age and it, it's also a very dramatic kind of style as well about what she expects in life and the reality of things and that sort of thing that kind of clashes with each other and changes her mindset and it's a really really fantastic movie um lady bird yeah i had uh, Lady Bird on my list as well i mean it's it's a similar journey that she go that she's going from but whereas yeah. obviously nadine's trying to find herself uh lady bird's trying to break out and be something uh she's yeah. got an idea already of who she wants to be and how to achieve it it's so it's like it's coming of something like an, an opposite direction but at the same time we're trying to achieve the same goal so it's a very good yeah. choice yeah and and then you know um i always like to refer to movies like this where um to all the boys i've loved before is really good it sounds a lot like it's a love story which it is but at the same time it's also a coming of age story about um about this girl who really needs to, you know, that after her letters go out, it kind of breaks her out of her own comfort zone, her own routine. And it's it's a really, really fun story. Um, one of, you know, best adaptations I've seen on screen. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan. I watch it all the time also. <laughs> and um, I, I think the last one is, uh, I, I think that people don't appreciate it as much, but that's, 
a personal feeling, and I think that's 2014's um, The First Time, which is about kind of just like a chance meeting between two people, and it, it has a little bit of a, it has a first love type of situation and a little bit of um, a coming of age element to it of two people who meet each other at a party and then they have this really strong connection with each other. It would be kind of, it feels a little bit like, you know, <laughs> if Erwin and Nadine had a love story and this was, hmm. this would be like a, the other side of it if they had this like blossoming romance focus instead. Um, and yet something about the first time is really, really endearing to watch and really fun because they have these conversations about, you know, the future and the things like that. And also uh, the character uh, that's the female character in this one is also very similar to Nadine, who is somewhat of an old soul who doesn't really get along with the people in her generation as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are my my three further viewing. Of course, there's a ton other um, that you can add to the list because, you know, uh, coming of age movies are definitely not lacking. <laughs> They're not. Um, for myself, um, I would, first of all, I would say don't watch The Duff because you might think, oh, The Duff is like this, but it's not. It's trash. So don't watch that. Um, do watch, however, Easy A. Uh, Easy A is a good one. With um, Emma Stone? Yeah. Yes. Did that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think Easy A's uh, the, 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 There's many ways to compare um, Her character with Nadine So I think they're very similar The other one I would uh, recommend That I fell in love with uh, last year Would be Booksmart Which too many people sort of like dismissed as just being like the female super bad But it's a lot deeper than that I think it's just a really Interesting uh, Take on the coming of age dramas These two girls are trying to find this this uh, finals party um, and in terms of trying to come with like their own directions that they're heading to in life and um, another one I would recommend is Election uh, which is by uh, it's one of those uh, sort of like 90s American indie movies it's uh, kind of a black comedy featuring um, Reese Witherspoon as um this overachieving student who gets into a uh, rivalry with one of her teachers when he decides to fix the election so, so that she actually loses something at life. It's a really interesting black comedy from Alexander Payne and one that I think has kind of been kind of forgotten but one is uh, worth rediscovering. Um, another fun indie is uh, Me and Elle and the Dying Girl which is another of my all-time favorite movies. I think it's really great. And again, it captures that awkwardness of the similar age, but obviously shown from a more male perspective uh, there. So those would be my personal sort of picks that I would uh, pair with. But you're right, Kim, there are numerous ones that you could touch on more. I mean, you could look at, like, John Hughes movies, which is obviously a big um, inspiration to... Um, Kelly Fremont Craig as a as a director, uh, she's so like him and like Nick Hornby and David Sedaris as all these like inspirations for her writing. So, and I think you can see it, see it throughout the work, especially with, like the Sedaris influence shining through there. So, if you uh, are looking for a David Sedaris starting point, I mean, I recommend either like Naked or When Engulfed in Flames. Both of those are really good starting points for his work. Or, um. The if you're wanting a more festive mood, then check out the Santa Land Diaries as well, which is um, does some really amusing reads as well. So, so there you have it. So you got a film and you got some book review, book recommendations from me as well. But yeah, that's what I'm going with. That's good. Really good choices. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, that was obviously Edge of Seventeen. Uh, thank you as always for listening. And uh, if you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to be listening to us. You can follow us on uh, Facebook and Instagram. 
And uh, you can also check out our full archive of episodes at moosandteapodcast.wordpress.com, uh, which has all our previous seasons, as well as our Friday Film Club, where every Friday both myself and Kim pick a film to recommend and uh, put them both together into a wonderful double feature. Sometimes there's a theme, sometimes there's not. Either way, it's a chance for us to further explore the movies that we love. Uh, but Kim, what are we looking at next? Yeah, we're uh, we're going into uh, the next movie, which is going to be a uh, 2017 horror anthology called XX, um, which is um, pretty much a collection of four short horror films that are directed and written by women. So yeah, definitely uh, going to be an exciting one, a chance for us to look at not one, but four female directors on our next episode and certainly if this season has been anything to go off uh, certainly the ladies have certainly shown us uh, some unique takes on the horror genre so I'm excited to see what they come up with in this uh, fun little anthology of stories so yeah we're going to be revisiting one one director that we've looked at before also in this one so it'll be it'll be good cool uh, but that's obviously coming up in our next episode but thank you as always for listening thanks to my co-host Kim and we will be back next time to discuss XX until then, good night. <laughs>